Hello, everyone. We're here with uh, Dr. Stefan Harzen, uh, which is one of the directors of the Taras Foundation, uh, where they develop a lot of studies regarding dolphins and the marine environment, um, and mainly the, the Palm Beach Dolphin Project. Um, and uh, Dr. Stefan has more than 30 years of um, working with the marine mammals and actually has done his master and PhD uh, here in Portugal with the um, Turciops truncatus, with the Boronos dolphins at the Sado estuary. Hi, That's Stefan. Right. Hi, Joanna. How are you? Good, good. <laughs> so, do you want to tell us a little bit about your experience, like, uh, over sure. the years? Sure. I mean, my, my graduate work involved, as you were referring to, uh, botanist dolphin in the Sadr estuary, and at the time that was reportedly the last resident population of botanist dolphins in Portugal. And uh, so I, I went, actually I went to Portugal in 1985, sort of a, just an exploration trip to see whether I could kick off any, any kind of studies there. And uh, then I started my field research in 1986. So was uh, you were if you were born by then at all then you would be uh, fairly young very small I was, <laughs> I was <really> young. <laughs> and uh, so back then uh, you know I did spend a lot of work uh, creating photo ID catalog um, I used for the first time in Europe I think a theodolite to track uh, the movement patterns in the estuary and so that was part of my masters and then I did some social behavior studies of the same dolphin population back then. It was about 40 to 60 animals uh, back then. And so I did that for my PhD. And uh, so since then, I've, you know, continued, uh, at least part in my life, continued to study dolphin and try to bring all my experience um, as somebody who studied dolphins to work every day. Excellent. And um, when did you did you start the Titus Foundation? Do you want to tell us a little bit about that project? Yeah, so the, yeah, I, you know, I stayed in Portugal until 1996, uh, 1997. So, I've been, um, you know, after 10 years, I finished my my PhD. I published a book, uh, The Botanist Dolphin of the Sada Estuary. was a little book for, for Portuguese people. There was a Portuguese version and an English version for it. And uh, so I had come to sort of an end to things. And, you know, I, from Germany, moved to Italy, then to Portugal. So I decided to continue my westward migration. And so I ended up in Florida. And then in 1998, I created the Taurus Oceanographic Foundation. And it's a non-for-profit uh, headquartered in Jupiter, Florida, in Palm Beach County. And it's dedicated to the long-term survival of people and the oceans through research, education, and cultural programs. So I wanted to do something that would allow me to do all three things. Uh, cultural meaning mostly connecting music and science and um, continue to do dolphin research. So we created this new project here. Right. And is there a big population? Is, is, is it a resident population there in uh, in Florida, in Jupiter, where you are? Yeah, so the botanist dolphins here, we, are, we categorize them similar to people. Um, so we have resident dolphins that are here, like resident people live in Palm Beach County. Then we have what we call here snowbirds, which are people who come from New York and Chicago in the winter to stay in warm Florida. And there are some dolphins who behave in a similar way, who are just here uh, for several months and then they seem to disappear. And then we also have uh, transients, basically dolphins that we see once or twice, and then they are gone. But we have some that come back in after a couple of years. Um, so total, I think, and bottlenose dolphin, we have identified uh, more than 600 now. Wow. And mm -hmm. we still find new ones. And we also, uh, see Atlantic spotted dolphins maybe three to eight times a year. Uh, these are more pelagic dolphins, and every so often they come close to shore. And then they're here in groups of 40 or 60 and just uh, sort of do a high speed okay. transect, you know, through the area. Do you find them mixed with the, with the bottlenose, or, or it's usually I we, just. I, yeah, I think only once we did see okay. them together. Uh, typically, they are not far away from each other, but they're not really intermixed. 
Okay. All right. Okay. So, and that's like the two main species that you spot there? Yeah, these are the two species that you can find alive. Every mm -hmm. so often you have stranded dolphins like pygmy sperm whales or mm -hmm. something like that, or common dolphin. But when it comes about life populations, and these are the two main species that are in coastal waters. And I should say that, you know, I only we only work within essentially 10 miles of the coastline. Mm -hmm. And most of our sightings are within a mile of the beach. And so it's really very close. And it has a little bit to do with the topography uh, or the bathymetry of the ocean. So we have some shallow beaches and then it drops off 40, 50. And then we have some offshore reefs about two miles offshore where it goes down 100 plus feet. And there are some channels from the deep waters to the shallow waters that dolphins used to come in. And then they hang around. There's still a lot of food. So they spend a lot of time uh, foraging and engaging in sign of social activities too. Do you get a lot of babies there as well? Or? Yeah, every year. Every year we have uh, offspring and uh, they seem to be doing quite well. Um, and we have them all in our catalog and some we are able to, to follow. Uh, right. over, over the years as they grow up because they hang, you know they stick to their mothers for a while and so you have a chance to see that and then sometimes you see the same mom having another baby several years later and weaning off the previous one so we get a little bit of insight into that too right excellent and what about challenges i, I mean you've worked Mainly with bottlenose dolphins, like in terms of your career. Um, in, in, in terms of studying them, yes. Studying, yeah. Uh, on my free time, I try to go and see other species, obviously. Humpback whales, you know, sperm whales, gray whales, blue whales in California, around Hawaii. and uh, But yeah, for work, in terms of my scientific exploration, if you want to call it that, that's mainly uh, small dolphin species, bottlenose, and now Atlantic spotted to some degree. Right, right. And uh, so, what what have been like the challenge that you faced while working in the in the wild? I mean, some story that you don't mind sharing with us. <laughs> oh, I think uh, you know there are always challenges. So when you start out, uh, usually the biggest challenge is to have the funding to go, uh, the funding to have the boat, so you can go at your own will, not depending on other people to take you on their boat. And I think uh, if you have the level of enthusiasm to study anything, whether it's dolphins in our case or, you know, parrots, some, somebody goes to the uh, South American jungle or something, uh, then the main challenge are, are really just logistical ones. Uh, okay. Because we don't really do it for the money to begin with. And uh, so really the obstacles are having the boat, having the equipment, you know, having the money to pay for the gas to get out. And if you had unlimited resources, obviously I would be out there every day for eight hours um, mm -hmm. because it's a great and fun thing to do. And it's nice to be in nature and see other animals do things and learn new things. Even if you do it for 30 years, uh, you still find new, wonderful things happening in front of your eyes. So, um, What was the most touching moment that you, you came across? Well, I, well, it depends a little bit on the context, probably, you know. So when, you, when I started out in Portugal, the, um, everything was new because I've never done it before, right? right. So uh, from launching the boat to driving around to trying to find them, uh, or once you see them, run to the boat and try to catch up and taking pictures and making sure the pictures are actually of good enough quality. So each little step becomes this great adventure. Mm -hmm. um, and very gratifying if it works and, you know, frustrating if it doesn't. And when you do it for a long time, then obviously some of these things become routine. Um, so launching a boat and doing a survey and looking out for them. You know what you do, you do it sort of automatically. And yet, for me, every time I actually spot them is uh, an exhilarating moment because um, you spend a lot of time or you can spend a lot of time not seeing them. And so when we do surveys and, you know, sometimes you see them in the first five minutes and it's great that then the day is already saved, you know, it's a great day no matter what. And then you have these days where you drive around for six hours and you don't see a thing. 
Uh, but I think, yeah, the great moment every time I'm out there is when I actually do spot them through the binoculars a couple mm -hmm. of miles away or so. I mean, that's really thrilling because I'm getting old now. So it's a re reassuring that my eyesight is still working. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's quite challenging to find them in the wild for yeah. most of the times. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but uh, it's very interesting. Um, when you you find them, it's always new. It's always there's always something uh, new, and I I completely understand the the thrill, even if you're doing it for a long time, and uh, obviously the routine of putting the boat in the water, all those getting airs, all those um, uh, steps that we take every day becomes it becomes a routine. Uh, but it's very exciting to see them. It always gives a little bit of. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then when you when you spend time with them, you're sort of close by, not too yeah. close, but yeah. um, then whatever they might be doing yeah. might surprise you, you know. Right. You, you, even if you see them chase fish and right. uh, jump out of the water and doing all these things, every time they do it, there's still this, wow, this is a great moment. Right. Uh, and experience that because you, that might be the last time you see it or uh, in the way you see it, you have never seen it before. Right. Um, uh, so the, the great thing about it, nothing is scripted, nothing is predictable. Right. Um, so you just have to be ready for it and then absorb it. Yeah. And um, have you, like Boronos, as a, as a Boronos expert, um, Boronos sometimes are quite um, sort of um, ag aggressive, sort of sure. bullies to the, to the other species. Um, have you have you ever come across a situation like that where bonanos were being aggressive towards other species or even within the group or other bonanos dolphins? Well, I mean, I haven't seen anything like this um, interspecies inter aggression, okay. you know, bonanos uh, with harbor porpoises or that sort of thing. Uh, I'm always careful uh, with the language, so I'm not sure they're really bullies. I, <laughs> I think that aggression is part of nature, right? Sure. So a cer certain level of aggression is required to survive. And it's our human perception of it that sort of distorts a little bit about, or a little bit the reality of what's really going on. So do dolphins have to be aggressive? Yeah, they have to have a level of aggression. Um, it's part of natural selection. Um, it's part of survival, it's a part of defending whatever social unit they might be attached to against predators. Um, and I'm not saying there's no possibility of aggression towards other species or on the level of what we consider bullying. Mm -hmm. I'm just not sure about it. Okay. And so I would be more cautious using the term unless I was sure, and it's hard to be sure, because you can't really see all the motivators in plain sight, right? Right. Uh, it's sort of through deduction uh, that that we arrive at some of the understanding of what motivates dolphins, right? You see right. them playing, and uh, so we call it play. Uh, when they swim around with seaweed, and then they drop it, and as a dolphin picks it up and swims around with the seaweed, uh, we, we call it play, and there's good reason to believe that it's play, but then play and exploration are very close in terms right. of what you consider function, you know? Mm -hmm. And so maybe they're just exploring things. Maybe they're just trying to figure out what the world is all about. Similar to, uh, just to sidetrack here for a moment, when you're born, you're a scientist. Right? This is quite an amazing thing. When you're a baby, you're completely... Um, objective, if you will, or unspoiled scientists, because you know nothing about the world. And so the way babies learn about the world is by biting on things, mm -hmm. grabbing things, holding on to things. And so maybe when dolphins bite on things like seaweed or other things, they also learn something about the environment, just as we do as we are babies. And then, of course, you know, little humans, uh, when they start to crawl, then they learn about gravity. And then when they get a little older, they learn about human psychology because they see their moms and dads react in different ways to things they do. And so this is all the greatest time in your life as a scientist is probably when you're born to when you're five or six. And once you get in school, they beat it all out of you. 
Right, right, right. And was it is it very different <clears throat> to work in Portugal and now uh, you know uh, work in Florida? And I, I mean, you've worked in a lot of places. What yeah, I think the obviously there are cultural differences, right? I mean, and they are just there. Portuguese culture is different. Uh, I always have a great time in Portugal. I I had you know the when you begin on this path of being a dolphin scientist or researcher. Yeah then I think the, it's great to be in a place like Portugal, at least at the time when I was there. And you never know whether it's really like this today. But back then I learned, uh, I, I hung out with some of the local fishermen and they would show me things and tell me things about the Sado and the estuary and the ocean nearby. And so they would share some of it. And they thought I was probably not, uh, why would a German come to Portugal to study dolphins? You know, it makes no sense to them. Because mm -hmm. to them, dolphins were not, the kind of animals that we think of them. Uh, they were just what they, as you know, they call them rouage. And for them, they were just like competitors, you know. And there were still instances back then where people shot at dolphins to get them off their nets and so on. But um, Portugal, in, in a way, you know, back then Portugal, and maybe it still is a country where <clears throat> planning is not really the favorite activity. Improvising is more... Uh, in the nature of Portuguese people. So uh, when I tried to plan things out, it typically wouldn't work. In America, everything you can plan, it's very reliable, and uh, you don't have this kind of uh, uh, issues where you have to run after people and try to catch them between coffee breaks and lunches and all that stuff. Um, but it's very charming, and maybe in retrospect, it looked even better than it actually was back then. But I think the big difference is really about culture. There's always competition. Uh, so always other people who want to study dolphins and uh, there, want, there are people who don't want you to study them because they, don't really, they really want to study them. So these kind of uh, obstacles or challenges, they are, they are really in all places. But back then Portugal was, um, you know, at the brink of becoming a member of the European Union, there was a lot of opening new doors, trying out new things, learning about Europe. And so for me, it was a great education too. Right. Now, for sure, uh, the, the marine mammal world, I, I think in general, it's um, quite tough and competitive. I mean, science in general, it's quite competitive. Uh, yeah, and I think you, you have to look at it uh, from a relaxed perspective, so to speak, right? So like you, you have a project, you look, uh, you make sure you have enough money to run your project, stay focused on it. No point to think about what other people might be doing while you're doing what you're doing as long as you figure out a way to fund it and get people to participate. And when you try to publish something and if it's published, it's great. And if it's rejected, don't, don't cry over it, you know? I mean, um, and just keep going. And even if you don't publish for 10 years, um, as long as you keep doing the work and you're enjoying it, where's the problem, right? <laughs> I mean, un unless you want to have an academic career, right. where, you where you want to go to the university and become a professor and teach the next generation, um, you can do it in a way you like it. You know, it's, it's really a very individu indiv individual uh, profession Perfect. with a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, that most people in their lives will never experience. So it's in a way, it's a very privileged place to be in to study dolphins, because for most people it doesn't deliver anything. You know, no Teflon pans, no new technologies. We're just looking at the world as it is, and try to enjoy it, and then tell stories about uh, the world and how wonderful it is. And we try to get people to look at the world in the way we do, and really appreciate and enjoy it. You know, right. that's sort of the mission, I think. Right. You guys have done uh, quite a lot of um, uh, public awareness as well there with the Taurus Foundation. Do you, do you think people are more sensitive nowadays? Or, um, I mean, over the thir more than 30 years that you've been dealing with these uh, subjects, um, how, how, how's your feeling about people's um, behavior and uh, uh, attention that they pay to, to the environment nowadays? Yeah, so advocacy 
for dolphins and the ocean being their environment in which they live in or any other natural resource, obviously it's important. Um, I'm not so sure whether we have made any significant progress. And the reason I'm saying this is, if you ask people, they're probably response that they're more aware of it, right? So they're more aware of pollution issues, they're more aware of plastic, they're more aware of uh, air pollution, they're more aware of uh, water pollution, they're more aware of uh, shrinking habitats. Probably more people than 30 years ago will, if you were to do a survey, will, right. check, will check those buttons. Uh, but that's not really relevant, you know? the. What's relevant is whether behaviors and attitudes are changing. And there I have my doubts because if people who come to do whale watch, let's say, you know, or watch some dolphins, they're all excited, they jump up and down the boat. If they see something, then they shake your hands or whatever and thank you. They might even give you a hundred euros, you know, as a donation to advance their work. But then they go home and live their lives like they did before. They had all that experience. So mm -hmm. does it really transform people to live a different life that is less focused on consumption, that is less focused on material things? Uh, there I am a little bit more pessimistic because I don't see it. You know, we are still consuming more every year. People still stand in line for the next iPhone or the next gadget or whatever. And so I'm not really sure that their personal lives express those kind of changes in attitudes that might otherwise have occurred, you know? So I think there's, there might be more awareness, but awareness in itself uh, doesn't do anything, you know? You can be aware of that smoking is bad, but you might still be smoking. Right. Mm -hmm. and, a lot of, and a lot of people do. So, and uh, in that sense, I think we, we can't stop because we're sort of committed to the cause, uh, but we shouldn't have uh, overly uh, expensive um, expectations right. uh, when it comes to people. Uh, people just don't like change. And people don't like uh, to sit around and do nothing and just stay at the ocean. I mean, most people can do this for half an hour or something, but they really can't do it for hours. And when they're in this kind of solitude mindset, um, uh, most people probably go berserk, you know. Yeah, no, it's true. And especially when you're looking at the ocean, even with the goal of finding animals, uh, if we spend hours without seeing them, you can see that a lot of people, at least the ones that are certainly less experienced, they got they got very anxious, nervous, they're agitated in the boat, so frustrated as well. Yeah, and you can also see it when you look at real estate, you know, uh, people like to build houses on the beach. And typically that's very expensive. So yeah. only rich people really can afford to live right on the ocean. <laughs> But they don't look at it, you know? They, they look at the ocean as an amenity, you know, mm -hmm. as a nice backdrop. They don't spend hours on the balcony now uh, looking at the ocean for anything, whether it would be dolphins or whether they just look at it and think about all the myriad of life that is below the surface. They just want it as an amenity and they don't look at it as a jewel. And so, it, you know, maybe we should change the rules that only marine biologists could live in those houses. <laughs> I'll find that one. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so, and what about the zero waste project that you guys have been developing uh, there? Do you, the, you want to tell us about? Say that again? The zero waste project? Well, I, I think our foundation is... Uh, was created with a sense of being zero carbon project, right? right. So before I left Portugal, I, I did teach a couple of uh, workshops in Portugal about waste, solid waste management and sustainability. And uh, it had something to do that I was doing some work for Auto Europa to help them with their uh, solid waste uh, streams. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was also a wonderful organization, and still is in Lisbon, uh, called FLAT, Fundação Luz Americana. <laughs> And I have a good friend there, Charles Buchanan, and he put together a workshop on sustainability uh, in 1990 or something, very early on, one of the very first workshops, long before the Rio conference and everything. 
And um, so I had a, an interest and some good education on the issue. And so I always believe that when we do engage in conservation, we have to be careful not to destroy the very environment we are trying to protect. Right. Right. So think about uh, an aquarium or a zoo or something. And so they're promoting the health of the ocean. At the same time, they typically have a gift shop where they sell all sort of stuff that should never be sold because it's made of micro fibers, plastic, uh, you know, little t little dolphins made out of whatever it is coming from China. And they're selling this to support their mission, but their mission is to prevent those things from ending up in the environment. And um, so I always felt that it would be good to uh, create an organization that adheres to the principle of zero carbon and essentially zero waste. And so what we have been doing is to uh, generate as little carbon as possible so we don't have offices and pe places for people to come. Uh, if people want to come and see what we do, they can come to the ocean, that's the office. And uh, so we are offsetting our carbon uh, by investing money. Uh, it's basically like uh, you can offset carbon, buy it on a carbon uh, market. And we invest the money into seagrass restoration in the Caribbean. And so uh, whatever carbon we uh, generate a year, we try to offset uh, so that our balance at the end is zero. And we are conscientious about these issues. And I think every organization, uh, whether it's mine or your, uh, should do some math and figure out how much carbon they generate by burning gas on the boat and by driving with the cars to the marina and, you know, doing things at home. And you can just get some ballpark figures and you don't have to really know the carbon footprint of a pencil and a piece of paper. You can just take the big stuff like um, uh, power, electric, uh, electric. supply in, in electricity in your house, um, the gas in the car, and a couple of these big things. And then you just double them at the end and that covers for all the other office utilities you're using. And that's, yes. a, good, and that's a good way to set a signal uh, to everybody that what we are doing is conservation, but we're also conscientious about that we have an impact on the world while we're in the pursuit of conservation research. And uh, we are conscientious enough to offset this by investing some of our money back into a project that then uh, absorbs carbon out of the atmosphere. All right. And for sure, uh, every time researchers use their boats to go out, you know, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of fuel, it's a lot of... Um, pollution uh, so yeah uh, so we and do then, need to be cautious with that as well yeah we should uh, it just makes it more um, it just reflects on your own understanding and appreciation of the work you do and the objectives you have right so when you yeah. have a conversation with somebody uh, who is uh, excited about dolphins and donates some money but they live a lifestyle that is um, undermining the very things you're trying to achieve as a non-for-profit mm -hmm. that we can have an honest con um, conversation about it. Um, right. So yeah, if you're a dolphin researcher and you are concerned about conservation or conservation in general anyway around the globe, you simply can't just drive a Porsche, you know, and live in a house that is three times the size you need. Um, because then you are using just many more resources than you need to to have a decent lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, right. to, it's, a, I mean, it's a balance, uh, a difficult balance nowadays. Well, if you want to be true to what I consider true to be, it's, it's really just for me, right? I mean, I'm not imposing my value system on anybody. I'm just saying to be true to myself and my intentions. Right. Uh, that's the way I manage those. Somebody else might say, uh, you know, I like to drive a Porsche, but I live in a, in a shed, so I have no cost. You know, and the power I have is from solar. So the only environmental impact I have is a Porsche. And I really like driving a Porsche. Okay, so there are different ways uh, to do it, but I think there has to be much more of a discussion in the conservation uh, community about reducing the impact of all the things we do. Right. So over the years and uh, with the animals that you've worked, do you see more? For example, obviously the plastics. It's a big, a big issue. Um, for, for everybody and every living creature. Uh, do you see more plastic in the ocean than before or do you find less now? Well, that's also an interesting question because 
you know, back then when I started in Portugal, I, I wasn't even looking for it. You know, and once you start looking for something, you'll find it. Right. Because even if it's small, um, if you're really focused on something, you, you see it. And that's the same when you're on the open ocean or on the ocean of, away from the coastline and you look around looking for dolphins. If you were not looking for them, you wouldn't see them, even though they would be right there. And mm -hmm. you only see them because you're intentionally looking for them. So your whole mind right. is focused on seeing them. And that's the same, I think, with a lot of pollution issues, so plastic. And so I don't, I know that we had pollution problems in the Sado estuary in the 1980s and the 90s. Uh, you know, there were a lot of Moloks there. Uh, you know, there are a lot of indicators that the water was pretty polluted, uh, aside from the fact that you couldn't see the, the floor, sea floor, you know. But um, I think it really depends on whether you're searching or looking for something. And now when we go out here, yeah, we find plastic all the time. You know, we collect as much as we can. Most of it is small. Uh, but if you were, you know, going to the beach or you go and take um, a plankton net, and I mean, you could do that too, you know, behind your boat, you could uh, just pull a small plankton net and um, for the two or three hours, and when you get back, you just uh, look at it, and use some sieves to separate the particles, and you would see plastic and microplastic, uh, probably quite good amounts and we are trying to set up a study with a local university to to get a little bit more information about the local plastic pollution uh, mm -hmm. not looking at the big pieces that you can pick up on the beach uh, but looking at the smaller pieces that sort of escape the eye unless you get really close look at it yeah. and so yeah i mean given what we do throw into the ocean every year and the stuff that gets lost from ships and uh, i mean lost i mean really lost then of course ships also dump stuff and yeah. um so if you look at that yeah there's a lot of pollution in the ocean and um unfortunately people still think it's so big uh, that it doesn't matter you know but uh, it sure does matter and it enters the food chain so i think the the biggest concern i would have about pollution in the ocean aside from the petrochemical pollution that we knew from the past like ddt's and PCBs and, you know, heavy metals and all that mm -hmm. sort of thing. I think uh, probably the biggest threat, potential threat, is microplastic because it's already in the food chain uh, when you eat fish in a restaurant in the Algarve or in Lisbon or in Miami or anywhere in the world, probably already you're eating some plastic. And uh, you just don't see it and you don't taste it. And we don't really know whether it has a negative effect or not. Uh, but there's some rationale to assume that since our bodies were not designed or didn't evolve to deal with plastic, um, it can be a real big issue, especially if it can cross uh, membranes, right? So if, if you ingest plastic and it just goes through the system and you shed it at the end, that would be one thing. Uh, but if you have a contaminant that can cross membranes, that also means it can then enter into other organs and create some real havoc. And right. I don't think I don't think we know about it yet, but um, there's a lot of reason to be uh, very sensitive and very alert to the fact that there's a lot of plastic. And then, of course, the question is, what are you going to do about it, right? And that's sort of a political or social question. And again, it's. Uh, you asked me earlier about whether people changed, you know, greater awareness, yes, but uh, change in practice. I think there's, um, you know, people get all involved in these campaigns like don't use any straws. Right. You know, it goes all around the world and people go nuts about it. And, but that's not the biggest plastic problem we got. And this, I found some interesting social research that indicates that if you get people to do something uh, like not use a straw, for instance, the people who have then done one act, you know, changed mm -hmm. one thing, are far less likely to do anything else than the people who haven't done anything yet. Right. And so one, they... has to, one has to think about whether the stepping stone principle where you say, okay, let's get people started on this route of uh, less pollution with something small that doesn't hurt, that doesn't require too much energy. Um, it seems that the social research indicates that that is not a successful strategy 
because people feel that they've done their part to save the world and they want to be left alone. And then you have an ever-shrinking pool of people who will just do one thing. And that means, in consequence, that you have to be much more strategic about what you're asking people to do. So let's say you're looking at plastic straws and plastic bags and the threat to marine environments and dolphins or small whales ingesting plastic bags mm -hmm. uh, by error and so on. Um, you have to think about strategically, is it more important to get people off plastic straws or off plastic bags? And if plastic bags is more difficult, but it's more effective, then you should opt for that and leave the straws alone. Mm -hmm. you, know, you shouldn't try to convince people to do something whose impact is minimal compared to an alternative. Of course, that's something not everybody likes to hear because a lot of people still believe that you can do little things at a time. Uh, but it, to me, it seems that the social research suggests that people are not working that way. We are not wired that way. Okay. Well, that's, an inter that's an interesting consideration if you think about how do I organize a campaign to make the world a better place, whether it's somewhere in the jungle, on the mountains, on a lake, or on the ocean. Uh, we have to be much more selective, I think, in the way we approach it and be more strategic about it. How yeah. do we get the most out of a one-time action? Right. For sure, yeah. No, it's a it's a, a, a different perspective from what usually uh, people hear about. I think there's yeah, a lot of let's just do little things. Yeah. And so, I think when you when you talk to decision makers, um, you know, public representatives, politicians, or local authorities, or people who have some weight in a local community. You have to do the effort and produce this kind of social research uh, that is out there and show it to them so you have something more than just your opinion, right? Yeah. Uh, so you have to include that part of science if you really want to do advocacy particular issues. If you do glo more global advocacy and say let's all do good for the ocean because we love dolphins and sea turtles and sharks and all the other stuff that is out there, like sponges, uh, which are used in Portugal for some real great medical research, uh, which you might be aware of, um, and to create pain medication, and they're doing a really great job. So uh, we need the ocean for all these opportunities still to come, and I think uh, we just have to be more selective in how we design these kind of advocacy campaigns. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Stefan, um, more, more of a personal question. Uh, imagine that there's you don't have any problems regarding budget. Uh -huh. uh, okay, which is always a big issue <laughs> when sure. we talk about science. So let's solve that. Uh, um, what would you like to to study, to do? What are the questions that you really wanted to see answered? Um, if you could, like... Well, if I had, you know, if I had an unlimited budget, I'm I'm at the age now where I would, uh, you know, make sure I surround myself with young people um, and open the doors for them and get them going and, um, you know, find answers to the questions. Some of them, there might be no answers to, you know, but there are, there are interesting questions such as, why do dolphins hear sounds up to 150 kilohertz, you know, while we only hear 15? Uh, what is there to listen anyway? You know, why do male humpback whales sing? Uh, do dolphins see an image in their brain that is similar to what we are seeing? Uh, does a dolphin think? And if he thinks, what does he think about? Uh, do whales dream? Why do dolphins have pointy rostrums? You know, I mean, there are so many questions, even questions like, why is it important to study dolphins, you know? Mm -hmm. Who, does anybody really care? So I, I think there are all these wonderful questions out there. And if I had the money to run like a you know, foundation with uh, people uh, and there was enough money to have you know, a group of people, then I think that would be sort of the, the ultimate satisfaction to, to be moving a little bit aside, you know, providing some support in terms of experience and the limited expertise I have and uh, use it to, you know, just keep younger people, uh, provide them with an opportunity to pursue these things and ask these questions, find answers if they can be found. 
and come up with other questions and be more of a mediator, you know, than uh, the one who has to actually do all the work. <laughs> so, yeah, that, I think that's what we, that's sort of the natural, that's a natural curve of things, you know, the trajectory. I think that maybe in scientists we have, as scientists we have that more than in other professions. But um, I think the most, the, the important point is that once you get to your own career, if you want to call it that, and you sort of know uh, you cannot do this forever, and you still want to go out, but then the best thing if you have money is to surround yourself with other people and let them create their own careers and uh, create this network of uh, people under one roof where they can engage and pursue this different line of investigations. And that would be a great thing, you know. It could be, could be here, could be in Portugal, you know. Um, all you need is really a sort of a physical place uh, where people can come together. And you do it with volunteers and interns, but yeah. if you project your, yourself 30 years ahead and then you're saying, oh yeah, you know, uh, at that time, hopefully I have an unlimited budget and then instead of having volunteers come here, I have some scientists that actually do it and they have their volunteers. And, right. uh, but then you could sort of become like a private research group that is similar to how universities work, you know. Okay, good, good. Uh, yeah, no, that's that's excellent. Uh, is there any place or species that you would really like to work with or to see that you, you've you never seen and you're really interested? So well, I mean, different it, questions, but yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, if you're thinking about unlimited budget in that sense, you know, then if you don't have to work at all, um, and you just get a check every week or every month, then, yeah, I would like to see some other species in their natural environment. I, I would like to see uh, natural environments that I have not been uh, privileged to see, you know, whether it's on yeah. the Antarctic or the Arctic or whether it's um, the South Pacific. Um, I would definitely like to go around and, you know, spend a month or two um, in all these places and take pictures and videos. Um, and then you would have to find a way to use all that and right. sort, of, sort of share it in some form of story um, with other people because otherwise it's just for your own personal gratification. Uh, um, any, any particular species that you would really like to see or work? No, for a long time I want to see blue whales and then I saw blue whales. Okay. And so, that's, so that's pretty impressive. Uh, humpback whales I saw fairly early on, uh, back in the... Uh, early 90s in Hawaii, so I spent six weeks there. And uh, spinner dolphins I saw there, uh, gray whales I've seen a lot, uh, killer whales I would like to spend more time with. So maybe that's a species that I would like to go to uh, the Pacific Northwest and uh, in a li little house close to the area where the killer whales show up. <laughs> So I can sit there and, and watch it yeah, from the just porch. With the, and then, the virus or without any virus. And then run down to the boat once they're there, you know. But yeah. uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think those, those uh, killer whales are pretty impressive. And sperm whales, I always loved sperm whales. So I haven't really spent time with sperm whales and I would love to do that. There's actually a place not too far away from here in the Caribbean where you can uh, do that. Uh, but I haven't really haven't had the logistical setup to go there and do it. But then, with unlimited funding, I could just charter a boat and that would be it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, Stefan, um, I think I don't have more questions, but anything else you want to share? No, I think, uh, you know, for people who want to pursue this as a career, I would just say, you know, go for it. Uh, don't listen to anybody else who is trying to get you off that track if you really want to do it and uh, then do it and you know do it with the understanding that this is not going to be a money-making profession uh, you're not going to be able to live a lifestyle like bankers and high financiers and people like that uh, but uh, if it's good for you if it's good for your soul for your mind uh, if you're curious about the world um, then it's a great thing to do and I think for the general public uh, if they listen to our conversation, then hopefully what they get away from it is 
that there are a lot of uh, jewels, uh, natural jewels out there, uh, that for most people remain undiscovered. They are discovered in the, in the literature, and they are in, written about in libraries mm -hmm. and all that. And you can watch it on, um, you know, the Discovery Channel or National Geographic or something. Uh, but once you're out, you'll you'll know that it's not the same. Watching it on the tube or being actually out there. So I would say for all the people who are listening uh, in Portugal, they should all go and pay you a visit, and uh, <laughs> uh, you can help them find ways to actually see dolphins for themselves. And uh, Obviously, they also, if they don't like the Algarve, they could go to Sado, uh, mm -hmm. where they do still some, some pretty good uh, dolphin tours, I think. And um, so that's ways to experience mm -hmm. nature. But I think, yeah, for everybody, uh, it would be good to rediscover personal connection with the world that we live in. And for some people, that means oceans and dolphins. And for others, it means forests and trees and mountains and... Uh, I, I don't really care what it is that uh, inspires you, but I would hope that every single person uh, has a sense of nature that surrounds them and finds a way to use that as a source of energy and motivation for their, for their right. daily lives. And they're not looking at it simply as an amenity, uh, like going to the, you know, and, and just take it for granted. Right. But, uh, really appreciate the fact that Mother Nature is serving this to us. And there are a lot of services, we could talk another two hours about all the services these ecosystems provide to humans. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would think that, you know, if people find a deeper and greater appreciation of oceans and dolphins, that would be great. Right. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Thanks Hi, for everything. Ah, um, most thanks for all your help help uh, since we started the organization you've been uh, 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 helping us for the past uh, 10 years so it's been it's been great uh, yeah, having really your, your your input um, as, as a as a scientist as a, a researcher and uh, obviously as a person as well so thank you very much for all that well, thank you, uh, and thank you for <laughs> our friendship and all the good times we spent together. And, uh, you know, hopefully once this whole COVID-19 thing apps a little bit, uh, we'll have a chance to see each other, and either in the Algarve or should you come to the next big conference, which is right next door to where I live, in Palm Beach. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, bye take bye. care now. Okay, bye-bye. Nice talking stop to you. Right